Mike, do you want to play it again? I missed the, the window. Why don't you start now? Okay, bright good morning to everybody. Welcome to Plants, Pests, and Pathogens. We are in the April 23rd meeting, and a couple of quick tips for you as we move through the program. I uh, would appreciate if everybody would use the chat pod, which is over on the left-hand side at the bottom. You can type in into that, add your, your name, your county, and the number of people that are in the room with you so we can get a feel for the total number of people who participate in the program. Just a quick note that everything that you type into the chat pod is visible to all of the moderators, so there's no way to send a private message while we're on um, Collaborate. If you would leave your, t your microphone button turned off, except when you're speaking, then that will minimize the amount of feedback that we get. Um, that, that's really helpful. The microphone button is over on the left-hand side of the screen, um, just above the participant list. There's a microphone button and a video button, so you need to push that microphone button when you're ready to talk. Agents, we'd appreciate if you would register on LMS so that you get continuing ed credit for the program, and um, also if you record the attendance would be really helpful. I'm Lucy Bradley. I'm the Extension Urban Horticulture Specialist here at NC State. Delighted to be working with you on plants, pests, and pathogens. And Lee J. Temple, who's our instructional technologist, is still off on maternity leave. These are brand new pictures of Emily, who was born February 18th, but it's now 10 inches or 10 pounds long and 22 inches. So we're missing Lee J., but glad she's home with Emily. The, this screen is kind of an introduction to the key things that you need to know about participating in this program via Blackboard Collaborate, which is the software that we're using. Um, setting your connection speed is important so that you get real-time um, information. You can check your audio connections using the audio setup wizard. That helps you make sure that the sound that you're hearing through your headset and the, the sound that's going out through your microphone are as best as they can be. You can create a user profile um, by going to the preferences and my profile to give information about yourself. And then when people scroll over the top of your name, that profile option appears. And you close out of the session by clicking the X in the upper right hand corner at the final, at the very end when, when we're all done. This red arrow, um, let's see, this red arrow right, right here points to the talk button, which is what you need to turn your microphone on. And then later on when we're doing quizzes and have lots of other um, of options for you to do, these are the, the buttons that will allow you to put, put a smiley face up that shows that you're enjoying what the speaker is sharing. You can, if you're going to be away from the um, presentation for a little bit, you can click the button and it says that you're away so we don't call on, on you. You can raise your hand by pushing the hand button. And you also will be able to use this polling button, which is the last one. And it will either be you know, a, a red check and a, an X if it's yes or no, or there will be A, B, C, D, or however many options there. The chat pod is down at the bottom. Um, that's where you can type in questions if you don't have a microphone. It's great. If you have a mic, go ahead and use it. Um, it goes faster when you're, when you're talking than typing, at least for me. <laughs> um, but you, you do have this, the, the capacity to, to type into this chat box to, to share information. Anybody have questions on Collaborate and how, how this works? Okay. Let's take a second to, to weigh in. If you go over to your um, My screen just went a little bit weird. Um, if, if you grab the pointer, you can go. I'm going to just try this for a second. Excuse me. Ah, much better. All right. Over on the left hand side, you'll see a, a, a series of buttons. If you grab the one, it may look like a pointing hand, it may look like a star. Um, when you click on it, it gives you options about what you want it to, to be. Grab the star and then go over to your county and, and click where you are so we get a sense of how much of the state is represented and who's where. Let's see, I see two, four, five people have, have done that. Got, got hands pointing as well. So we got the northeast, north central, western. We have somebody in each one of the districts, which is great. 
um, thank you for for helping us capture that. Okay. Much of the information about the plant specimen pathogens program is on our website, which you can get to at this tiny URL. Let me grab a different pointer so you can actually see it. This tiny URL up here, um, 4W7WXOL. So that will take you to this website, which has the schedule of the program. It has who the speakers are that are coming up, what the topics are that are coming up. It's got uh, where you can go to be a part of the downlink sites if you want to see it with other people. It's got technology tips, recordings of previous um, messages, and uh, all kinds of great information. So check out the website. First up this morning, we've, we've got Michelle Wallace, who's the extension agent in Durham County. Michelle, welcome. Thank you for coming on for one of the agent updates. Thank you. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, so I'm going to ask Lucy to progress my slides because I can't. I haven't quite figured out how to do that. When I was asked to, to do this, uh, I thought it'd be interesting to look at snakes, not because we love getting these in the office, but because they sometimes we get calls uh, about whether or not a snake is poisonous, and and people will bring them into our office. So. This, this particular snake was brought into my office, and uh, it's just a brown snake, but a lot of people are wonder whether or not it's uh, a copperhead or if it's poisonous. And so the point of this is just to give you some tips on how to, uh, to know whether or not you've got a poisonous snake. Make sure to tell people that they have to bring the snake in a sealed jar. And also, sometimes it's better, if you're really not sure, just to leave it alone. Um, so if we can move to the next slide. So if you look at a close-up of uh, the brown snake uh, versus the copperhead, look at the eyes. The brown snake has round eyes, and a, they, well, they both have round eyes. But look at the pupil. It's, it's a round pupil versus the pit viper that has the um, the more elliptical pupil. Not that you're going to get really close to this, but if someone brings it to you in a jar, it, it's really easy to see. And usually, it, I mean, the brown snake that was brought to me it was very easy to see that it had a round pupil. You don't even have to identify the snake. You can just look at the pupil. Hey, you want to go to the next slide? Other things that you don't have to get too close to when you're looking at the snakes is if you see copperhead babies have this yellow tail. So you don't have to get close to the snake to see whether or not it's got a yellow tail. You can, it, it's usually pretty visible. We can move on. If they're all curled up like this, you can notice that the cover head has a very definite triangular head, whereas the brown snake doesn't have a defined a triangle. It, it's not anywhere near. And you also notice that the, the coloration of the snakes is very different. Uh, you can see these, these dark spots that are in regular patterns along the snake versus the more modeled uh, look of the copperhead. We can move on. Now, colorful snakes really scare people. This is a, a picture of a, a scarlet king snake versus a coral snake, and they look very similar. Coral snakes are very, very rare. 
they're on the endangered species list and it's very rare for someone to come across one. We, we actually wouldn't want anyone to kill this snake even though it, if it bites you, it will kill you. Uh, it's a very non-aggressive snake. It, it's not gonna, it does not seek anything. Uh, and, and so, the, look at the coloration, because the, the king snake is mimicking the coral snake. And if you look, you'll see that red, neck, red bands are always next to black bands, always. And with the coral snake, you'll see that red bands are always next to yellow bands. The other thing about the coral snake is the head is always going to be black. So, um, and if you look uh, at the king snake, there's red mixed in with the black, so it's not just black. It, so, hopefully that, and, and I don't know, when I was a little kid, I learned uh, when red is next to black, it's a friend of Jack, whereas the coral snake, when red is next, when red is next to yellow, it will kill a fellow. So it, even though the coral snake is the most poisonous snake in North Carolina, you don't hear a lot about it because it is so rare. Uh, but when people, I have been brought in uh, a snake to identify and, and people just want to know, is it poisonous? And so you can ask them these questions, and uh, but you, you should discourage people from getting too close. Next slide. So the thing that we recommend is to avoid them. They're, they really are do they have a role in our environment? They they help with uh, rodents and uh, they eat bugs and a lot of the snakes are eating other snakes. So one of the reasons why North Carolina is the number one state for snake bites is people mess with them. Uh, the, and so one of the things that you can do is discourage snakes from being on your property, if it's possible, can we go to the next slide? And that is by removing wood piles, covering compost, uh, clearing, clearing out weedy areas, uh, places that snakes are going to hang out where rodents hang out, because that's what they like to eat. They also are going to hang out where it's hot, and that's why a lot of times we'll see them baking on a compost pile. So if you're wanting to protect yourself and you're concerned about getting bit because of maybe stepping on one, make sure to wear uh, gloves and, and good boots, and uh, especially if you're working in areas where there's a ground cover. Wear pants and instead of uh, making sure to establish path where you can walk so that you don't have to walk through a ground cover in order to get from one place to the next. Uh, so I think that's my last slide. Michelle, Michelle thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. So the, the rest of our program today is outlined in this slide. We're going to be talking about garden photography. It's particularly garden photography for diagnostics and, and identification. And we'll have our showstopper plants and then current issues with insects and current issues with diseases. First up is garden photography. We've got Mike Munster, our plant pathologist, and, and Matt Bertone, who's our entomologist, both of whom are, are excellent photographers who are going to be sharing tips and strategies with us today. Welcome. Hello. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> okay, well, I, I guess I'll start. Um, well, I'm the new guy in the diagnostic lab. Uh, my name is Matt Bertone, and uh, I'm an entomologist. And I've been interested in insects and other organisms since I was about five years old. Uh, I don't know if my parents like that or not, but 
Uh, that's how it is. And I grew up up north in Pennsylvania and uh, got my bachelor's degree at Salisbury University in Maryland. And uh, I did my master's and PhD in entomology here at NC State. Uh, and I've been in North Carolina now for 12 years in June. So a good portion of my life. Um, and uh, I've studied various things over the years, uh, including dung beetles, flies, wasps, and household arthropods. And I have lots of other interests, including graphic design, macro photography, and the typical things, movies, music, games, and cooking. Okay. So today, uh, me and Mike are going to talk about uh, how to take good photos for best diagnostic results. If you're sending photos to get uh, pest diagnoses to the clinic, uh, there's some tips and tricks on how to do this. So basically, we're going to be talking about the basics of using S digital SLR point-and-shoot cameras or camera phones. And I'll be discussing insects, and Mike will be discussing uh, plant disease issues. OK, so first of all, you do not need this massive rig that I use to take my photos. Uh, to get good photos of insects and issues. Um, so I'm going to tell you basically how to use some of the other types of cameras that most people have. Uh, now a lot of people are getting these digital SLRs, these big cameras nowadays. Um, the disadvantage to them is they're bulky and you have to change lenses to get what you want. Uh, but the lenses are really good and the sensors are really good so you can get very clear pictures. Uh, it has very little shutter lag, so when you press the button, you, it takes the photo right away. Um, and you have many functions. You can have it automatic or fully manual functions to do what you'd like with it. Now, one of the more popular ones um, are these uh, typical point-and-shoot cameras, which are small, uh, compact. They have medium lenses and sensors generally a little bit of longer shutter lag. So when you press the button, it's going to take a few uh, split second to actually take the photo. Um, and they often have macro settings, which I'll talk to you about later. Uh, this is especially useful for close-ups of diseases, but also insects. And then lastly, uh, many of the phones we have these days have very good cameras, especially compared to uh, the phones that you, we used to have. Uh, and they're compact, and they're usually with you. The problem is that they have very small lenses and sensors, and they, it's, it might be a little bit more difficult to get really good results. But they're convenient because they're usually with you. OK. So before I start uh, getting into the nitty gritty, uh, let's talk about some basic terms. And this is especially true for SLR cameras. Uh, so shutter speed is how long the shutter is open. Uh, the aperture, which is represented by an F number, if you ever see that online, if you're shopping for cameras or lenses. This is the size of the hole that the light is coming through. And this is a strange thing where the number is inverse. So the larger the number, the smaller the hole, and vice versa. So a smaller number is a larger hole. And lastly, the depth of field. Uh, this is how deep the focus is. Um, so it gives you an idea of how much of the picture is going to be in focus versus kind of slices of focusness. Um, and so to show you that a little bit, the top picture here, I took both these. This is the same beetle. Um, I took with the same camera, same, same everything, uh, except for I changed the uh, settings. So in the top one, we have uh, an f5.6, which is a very large aperture. You can see it here, the big hole. Now that has a shallow depth of field, which means only a little bit of the beetle is in focus and the rest isn't. At, but it's also very bright because, of course, with a large hole, you get a lot of light coming in. Now with a smaller aperture, f16, you get more depth of field, so more of the beetle is in focus. But it's a little bit darker. So these are some basics of cameras. Uh, that you might want to use uh, in the future for photographing anything that you want. OK, so exposure is an important thing. And this is really the brightness of the photo. So daylight looks really natural and nice, but it usually means you need a slower shutter speed because it's not as bright as a flash. 
And this often results in fuzzy photos. So the longer the shutter is open, the more movement it captures. So you get the ghosting effects and the fuzziness. A flash can illuminate the subject uh, with less blur because it's quicker, but sometimes it can wash out the photo or be too shiny. And what I use for my photos, and you'll see a lot of my photos in the talk, are, is diffuse light. But that's difficult for the average person to do, and, and it's really not that important, especially for diagnostic characters. OK, so um, some cameras, like these point shoots, you can uh, have different focal distances, like how far the camera lens is from your subject. So one of the very important things to use if you have a point and shoot is this flower symbol. Turn on the flower symbol. That's the macro function. That's going to let you hold your camera up close to the subject and get a more magnified picture. Um, also, another thing about the clarity of the photo is, like I said, if the shutter is open longer, you're going to have more vibrations or movement captured. So either using a flash or holding the camera as still as you can while you're taking the photo are good things to do to get a very in-focus photo. Uh, another thing is that sometimes the cameras need help in focusing. So in this picture on the left, the camera is focusing on the ground because it's a very large area, and it wouldn't focus on these small twigs and this scale insect. Um, so one of the options you can do is actually you can put your hand right here or close to the actual insect or organism, especially if it's not dangerous, um, and uh, let it uh, focus on your hand and it will focus on the insect too and then pull your hand away and while you're still holding the shutter button to focus, uh, hit the shutter release and take the photo. So that's actually a good trick to use if you're having trouble focusing on the actual thing that you want to take a picture of. OK, so magnification, especially for insects, is very important because they're usually very small. And some of the little things that features they have can help you identify them. But getting that picture of that is difficult. So uh, some insects and critters, like mites and thrips, are too small to be photographed with typical lenses. Uh, for camera phones, you can hold a magnifying glass in front of the lens to increase the magnification. This is to a point. Um, and I've used basic magnifying glasses, just plastic magnifying glasses, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, lenses for phones can sometimes also be purchased online. You can get ones that snap on your phone, or you have a little magnetic ring that you can snap a little uh, lens on your phone. Um, and with magnification, it's always good to include a common size reference, like a coin or a pencil near the specimen, because we don't really know how close you were to that specimen. And sometimes the size of the specimen can actually really help the identification. Uh, so for your point and shoots, you can actually get, if you're really interested in getting close-up photos, or uh, you're going to be taking a lot of them, you can get these snap-on lenses. Uh, Rainox makes a really nice one that we just got in the lab. Uh, and these, with a little tube over the, uh, for some of these cameras have an adapter, where you can put this lens right on the top, on, on in front of the, the typical point and shoot camera lens. That can actually increase magnification. And also, like I said, uh, camera phones, you can put actually just a plastic magnifying glass in front of it. So here, I took this photo with my Samsung Galaxy S3 phone. And this is the macro setting for uh, on the phone. And this is a little beetle about 4.5 millimeters long. Now when I hold a magnifying glass in front of that, you can see you get a lot more detail. You can actually count the antennal segments, things like that. And it may, that little bump in magnification can actually be very important and can help a lot in identifications. OK, so you're getting the good clear photos, things like that. What parts of the insects do you photograph? Because certain insects have different characteristic characteristics. So in general, when you're photographing an insect, you want to get a top shot or a dorsal shot, and then a lateral shot or a side shot of the insect. And whole insects are good to have. Uh, you also want to generally make a plain background on it, either some leaves or paper or whatever. Uh, if there's too much going on in the background, it, it can distort uh, legs, say, or thing, little body parts that might be useful for ID. Okay, and just to 
be sure these are these are my photos. Most of these, um, well, actually, all of these insects. So just uh, you know, these are achieved through very large lenses, things like that. But you can you can do a pretty good job with other cameras too. Okay, so for beetles, uh, clear shot of the feet or the tarsi, uh, the antennae, and a photo of the underneath, so the, so the belly of the insect, uh, if possible, are useful. So beetles vary with their their legs, their feet segments, and their antennae, things like that. These are very good ways to identify beetles. Okay, for flies, uh, taking pictures of the wing veins, um, the thorax with the bristles and all that on that, and then the head, especially the antennae and the bristles on the head are very important for identification. Now keep in mind, if it's a very large showy insect, taking a whole picture of the entire insect is usually enough because they're very, usually very common and very conspicuous. Smaller specimens, though, you're going to have to take pictures of a lot, a lot more angles, basically. Okay, wasps and ants, you're going to want to take pictures of the antennae, the face, the top of the thorax, and wings. And for ants, the antennae are important and how the thorax meets the abdomen, right here. For butterflies and moths, uh, the best thing to do, if possible, is to take a live photo of the actual organism sitting there. Because uh, moths and butterflies, their natural stance and their coloration when they're alive are very important. Uh, once they're dead and they kind of curl up and they lose their scales, they're a little bit more difficult to identify. Okay, spiders. Uh, taking a picture of the body from above, uh, the web can be important and especially the eye arrangement and, if, if possible, the underbelly of the abdomen where the spinnerets are and things like that. Those are all really good uh, diagnostic characters for spiders. But like I said, especially eyes. Eyes are probably the most important because they're arranged differently in different spiders. Uh, larvae, you want to get up close of the heads and appendages, if any. Uh, whether it has appendages, like this weevil has no appendages, whereas this uh, caterpillar has uh, true thoracic legs and these pro legs, these fleshy legs on the back. Uh, those are very important. And also the situation, where you found it. Uh, was it on, under some bark? Was it on some parsley, like this, uh, this uh, black swallowtail larva? Uh, things like that can actually really help because certain larvae live in certain situations. And lastly, plant associates. So uh, things that are in or on plants, you want to take a picture of the plants, the damage. Here we've got the gall that I cut open and you can find this little gall midge in there. So all that information can be very useful uh, knowing the host and how, it's da and how the insect is damaging the host are very important. Okay, so some final words on the insects. Uh, first of all, patience will pay off. That's the most important thing, I think, uh, to take home today. Taking multiple shots within reason uh, from different angles to maximize chances of ID. So also being patient as, as far as, uh, you know, sit there for a minute or two and with the insect Make sure when you press the shutter button, especially on point and shoots and camera phones, that you're holding the camera very steady. And make sure you review your photos before you send them off to make sure that they're in focus. Matt, do you have some specific tips on holding it steady? I mean, you know, a tripod is an option, but if you don't have a tripod with you, what are some of the strategies that you use to hold steady? Okay, so um, if I'm kneeling down, say, uh, resting your arm or your elbow on your knee, things like that. Um, there's some really funny, there's some interesting ways online that people have done. They can, they, they'll tie a screw uh, bolt to the underneath where the uh, threads will be for the tripod and then tie a washer to it and then step on the washer uh, and that way they can hold the camera really tight and taut on a string. Uh, that's kind of a funny way to do it, but, uh, but there are lots of ways. Just try and get a nice, uh, a nice balance, you know, with your body and uh, kind of brace your arms, things like that. If you want to rest your hands on a table and put the insect on a table, and that kind of segues in the next part. If the insect seems really flighty, you really want to know what it is. You can always try catching it and refrigerating it for a long time, uh, and that'll let it cool down and uh, slow down. 
uh, or you can just freeze it and kill it and then take the photographs, um, especially if you don't want to release it or you think it's something you know common or, or dangerous. Um, lastly, some insects cannot be identified, especially the species, using photos, and so those will need to be sent in if you really need an ID. Um, so generally, like I said, the larger and showier insects are conspicuous and usually are more recognizable. The chances are that somebody has seen this insect, things like wheel bugs or big stink bugs or things like that. You can usually just get a picture of the whole organism and send that in and we'll have a pretty good idea of what it is. Uh, smaller insects are going to be more difficult again, but using that macro, that little flower setting on your cameras is a really good option. But again, try and get everything in focus. And what I like to tell people is get it in focus with the most magnification as possible, but both of those things uh, combined. You don't want something that's really close but out of focus, or also something that's in focus but very far away. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Mike to talk about uh, pathogens photos. All right, thanks, Matt. And you'll get a shot at Matt again in a minute, so if you have any questions for him, you can uh, you can do that actually right now if you want, or at the end of our photography session, we'll be glad to entertain all the questions that you may have. If not, then I will move on to the next slide and start out with this. Since our last plant specimen pathogen session, we have suffered a great loss in our department. Dr. Larry Grant, who just retired last year, a uh, great field mycologist and insightful photographer and and general outstanding individual died suddenly and will be greatly missed. I uh, would like to dedicate this portion of the talk to him. When we talk about insect, I'm sorry, disease diagnosis through photography, through images, it's important to recognize that not everything can be diagnosed from pictures alone. Here's a case where we could. This is a photograph that was submitted in March from Wayne County on red cedar, and it was clear that this is one of the genus Sporangium rusts, probably quince rust, even though we can't be 100% sure of which species. In this case, it doesn't really matter from a management or control standpoint. Just knowing that it's a genus Sporangium rust is enough. Here's another life phase of the same disease. This is the Eschil stage on fruit of ornamental pear, picture from Wake County in May of last year. So this are some things that we'll be seeing shortly here. So you can recognize this yourselves actually as Master Garden volunteers and of course agents if someone were to bring it into you or were to send in a photograph. And of course if they come directly to us, we also will be able to give a diagnosis based on the photograph alone. While few diseases can be diagnosed simply from images, they are excellent complements to physical samples that we receive. They indicate the setting, distribution, severity of the problem. They may show parts of the plant that are not included in the sample, for example, tree trunks, if they haven't cut the tree down. And they can even be used as a guide to sampling. If we can see a picture and we say, that's the plant that I want to get the sample from, or that's the portion you should send in. So it can be helpful as a guide in that way. And I want to give then a few tips on how to get the best pictures for image diagnosis. The first is to make sure you get different distances and angles on the problem, because one shot may not tell the whole story. This is a picture from September, October from 2009, Atlantic White Cedar. And it turns out in this case, that those mushrooms down at the base of the tree are important in the diagnosis. It was that particular time of year when our malaria is fruiting. It's our really only mushroom forming, true mushroom forming plant pathogen. And that helped with the diagnosis if we hadn't received a physical sample, which also confirmed it. But if you had taken this picture from another angle, you might not have seen those mushrooms there. If you had taken it from too close, we would have missed that aspect of the diagnosis. This is one of my favorite situations I like to talk about, where we got a couple of different distances, which is good. One fairly close to the foliage of this arborvitae, affected with some kind of a necrosis here. But when you see the larger image, you can tell that not only was there a real pattern to where the damage was occurring, 
which would help with the uh, confirmation of what they suspected that it was some cleaning product used on this building that had caused the burn. But also we see in the background what looks to me like runoff of the side on the sidewalk from the sidewalk onto the turf caused some burn there. So that was another piece of evidence that led to the conclusion that yes, this probably was some kind of phytotoxicity from a product that was applied there. We never would have seen the turf because it wouldn't have been submitted if that were the only thing that was sent. If we only got pictures of the tree itself or if we only got, worse yet, just some clips of the foliage from the tree. Now, how many pictures are enough and how many are too much? Well, we can represent this mathematically with a graph and we can see that one photograph is infinitely better than zero photographs, but then two is quite a bit better than three. I'm sorry, than one. Three is somewhat better than two. Four, a little bit better than three. Five, slightly better than four, and so on. So each additional photograph will not add all that much information. So just because one picture is worth a thousand words doesn't mean that ten pictures are worth ten thousand words. Now true, there might be on the 19th photograph some important clue that allows us to solve the case, but just as a rule of thumb, from three to five of the same situation are enough to send. Now, I'm not saying only take three to five in the field. You'll definitely want to take as many as you possibly can from different angles, different distances, and so on. And when you get back to your computer, wherever you're working with or sending them, review, see which ones are the ones that are best in focus and represent the overall situation that you're looking at. Now, more pictures may be needed, of course, if you're dealing with something that's affecting multiple plant hosts. I'm referring to a single situation on a single kind of plant here. Here's a case where one photograph probably isn't enough to tell us what's going on. This is a gardenia here in Wake County a couple of years ago. Uh, it also has the problem of the lens was dirty on the camera when this was taken, so there's a little bit of fuzziness in the center of the picture. But a close-up of the base of the plant was key because we could see that it has classic cold injury. This bark splitting, even down to the wood in this case, very often happens with cold sensitive plants such as gardenia. So don't forget the base of the plant, the trunk of the tree, down toward the ground line, and from different angles because something might be visible from one angle that's not from another. Now, I hate to admit it, but this plant actually was from my own yard and the cold entry wasn't the whole story even there. Don't forget to look at the roots. I didn't include a picture, but it turns out that this poor little plant also had root knot nematode, which may have contributed to its weakened state and the reason why it got some cold injury. When it comes to photographing turf, Lee Butler, our turf diagnostician, asks that people take a picture not just straight down looking at the spot, but looking out over the lawn so that he can see the pattern of things. On the left, you'll see a picture from uh, or of centipede grass, excuse me, from Pitt County, March of last year. This is kind of an interesting inverse picture. It's the brown, that's the centipede grass, that's the desired species, dormant at that time of year, and the green are weeds where the turf had been killed. So the pattern alone, in this case, allowed Lee to speculate that this could have been the disease known as large patch. The picture on the right from Cumberland County in May of 2011 coincides with the diagnosis of fairy ring that he made on this sample. So you can see the sort of ring-like mark where the grass has died. Here's a case where the turf in the backyard looked terrible, the turf in the front yard looked good, Lee found no diseases on it. I don't know why he didn't speculate on this, but I think that one of the pictures had the clue to what might have been going on there once we saw it. So again, you never know what picture is going to turn up that last clue that solves the case. When we're taking pictures outside, a lot of times we have problems with light because bright sun will tend to wash pictures out. These two were taken at the same time well, within a few moments of each other. And on the left, that was the way the sun was striking it that day. And on the right, I just stood in front of the leaves so that they would be shaded. 
And you'll notice how not only is the powdery mildew there clearly in focus, but you can pick out this sort of mosaic or vein clearing symptom on the portion of the plant behind the powdery mildew that wasn't very evident here because there were so many light or, uh, and light and shadow that obscured that particular symptom. Kind of a subtle detail here, but many cameras have a manual white balance that allows color to change depending on the light source. So these pictures also taken at the same time, one of them with the white balance set to daylight and the other with the white balance set to fluorescent. And you can see that not only the flowers but also the leaves have more of a bluish tint when the white balance is not correct. Mostly this is not going to interfere or make or break a diagnosis. Though. A few practical tips just to keep in mind as you're taking photographs. One is to pull the mulch away. We want to see how deep it was buried. And also in this case, if you remember, I think this is Danny Lauderdale's picture from the last Plants, Pests, and Pathogens. And we noticed that there were some girdling roots going on here that we might not have seen had the mulch been left around it to, uh, from when the picture was taken. Another is to show materials in sections. Split the wood open so we could see the blue stain in the case on the left, or in the case on the right, we see a nice discoloration of the wood where a canker was occurring. Sometimes this just takes the form of shaving off some of the bark. Here, there was injury, but we see that there's no necrosis, no dying wood there. So that's just the wound wood trying to heal over that injury, and it's not a true canker. We would have had our doubts if we hadn't seen underneath the bark in this case. Of course, many times you don't even see the canker on the surface. You have to actually shave a little bark away before you know it's there. Do show the upper and lower surfaces of leaves that have leaf spot problems. That can be a clue. Sometimes, not always, there's an injury that occurs on only one surface or the other, or a pathogen that's present on only one or the other surface. Uh, and, and to add to that, that's uh, similar for uh, insects, uh, because some insects will only be on the bottom surface or the top surface of the leaves. There you have it. Another clue that can be helpful is what the spot looks like when held up to the light. If there's sort of a water-soaked translucent area around the spot, that can be helpful to know as well. So hold the leaf up to the light and take a shot that way. A few tips about photographing macrofungi. These images came from Dare County last month, taken on a branch of a live oak tree there. And one nice thing about this photograph turned out to be, I don't know if that was intentional or not, but there's a broken piece on the fungal fruiting body that allowed us to get a clear picture of what was happening. And one really nice thing about this particular photograph was it was so large Let's see, I've got it written down here. It was 4608 by 3456 pixels. So we could get a nice zoom. It was well in focus. And we could clearly see that this is a polypore fungus because there are the tubes that form the part of the fruiting body where the spores are, are released. Anytime you're taking photographs of mushroom, now again, we've got uh, with Larry's unexpected death, we have a gap in our expertise for identifying mushrooms. But I do want to say what things you'll want to be sure and photograph. This is a good picture from several standpoints. One is that there are fruiting bodies, mushrooms in this case, of different ages. So we can get the picture of how they start out young and how they turn when they get old. We also have both the top of the cap or the pileus. We have the underside where the gills are. We can see a little bit of how the gills are attached to the site, which is important. We can see whether or not, although it's not exactly clear here, but it's important to know whether or not there is a little ring around the stipe, which is called an annulus. We've got a size reference here. The one thing that we're missing, and it's really important, is the base. These look like they were pulled out rather than dug. And you want to always dig out the base of the mushroom because if there's a vulva here or swelling, we want to see that to be able to help make the identification. Well, I say we. I don't generally identify mushrooms myself, but the experts in those. 
One last request when taking pictures. We don't know where in the world they came from or when they were taken unless you tell us. So if we see something that seems to be out of season or out of place, it's going to make us scratch our head. So please provide information, especially if it wasn't a recent photograph from North Carolina, but let us know where it came from and when the picture was taken. Now, we've included a few pictures and want your input, having heard this little spiel, as to what you think are the good and bad points about each one. So, turn it back to you, Matt. OK. So this photo was taken in November 2012 uh, from McDowell County. OK. Anybody want to chime in and tell me what's good or bad about this picture? OK, I see something in the chat box. Yep, out of focus. That's fairly obvious. Good, no relative size. So exactly, there's no size. This could be a, a three millimeter long caterpillar, or it could be a foot long. I doubt it's a foot long, but um, yeah, no context. That's good. So we don't know where it was uh, unless they tell us uh, or you tell us. So that's good to include all the information about that. So of course, if you include you know, it doesn't have to be exactly in that situation, but you can describe that situation. Um, it's just tough. It's very tough to tell uh, what this caterpillar is. I know it's a caterpillar, but uh, unless it is fairly big and showy, it's probably a bigger one. But again, I have no idea. So, okay. All right. These are photographs of longleaf pine needles from Robinson County from last month. What would you say is good and bad about this? All right, a couple of good points there. They're being in, uh, taken in focus, held up to the light. But yes, this is too close. We lose the context. We don't get to see two or three spots. For example, it would have been nice to see more in this case, see if any had resin flow. This is brown spot needle blight again. We talked about this in the last plants, pests, and pathogens. But it would have been good to see how they look on the overall needles, what portion of the needles are being affected, if any of them had resin exudate, and so on. OK, uh, this is another one from 2012 from Rowan County. Uh, what, what's good and bad? OK, yep. Yeah, it's sufficiently in focus, which is nice. Yep, exactly. We see some context, so we know this is uh, from a particular type of tree. Too cluttered? Yeah, there might be, it might have been uh, better to have less, uh, less busy background. And yes, exactly. Close up will be a little bit better, but luckily this test is uh, fairly uh, diagnostic from this far away. But it would be nice to include several photos at different magnifications. And also a size reference might be a little bit better because we don't know if these are a very mature tree. We don't know how big this uh, branch is, say. Um, so it might be good, at least in the description, or to hold up a pencil or something like that. All right, your comments on this. The concern was these fruiting bodies on the side of the cherry tree. Show the base, good. It'd be good to see what the bottom of the tree looked like a little bit closer. Yes, get closer. We'd like to see, remember the bit about the top and the bottom? We'd like to see the gills on this. Turns out that I was sure of what it was, or almost certain, based on these pictures, but it would have been good to see those gills on the bottom. This is Schizophyllum commun, which is a wood decay fungus that we fairly commonly see on cherry trees. May or may not be something that's affecting the tree as a whole, because if it's just infecting dead wood, 
killed by something else, then it's not the primary cause. But what would we want to see there? Not quite how big is the tree, but what's the crown condition like? Again, the timing comes in. Is this the time of year when it should have been leafed out? If it is, it would be nice to see what that tree looked like, its general health, based on the leaf size and how many leaves were on it. Oh, just, just to go back, uh, talk about that. That one picture was beech blight aphids on beech. So, uh, okay, but this photo, any comments? Okay, you know, the lighting's a little off. You can tell that the white balance is off. If this is on a sheet of paper, we know the paper is usually not yellow. So you could adjust that. Um, yeah, it needs a better focus. You know, it's an old specimen. And I think this is the only photo sent in, or maybe there was a couple more, but they were out of focus. So yes, the size reference would be great to have. Um, and I know there's a moth, but it's almost impossible to tell from this photo. And this would be one that you might have to send in, but it also might be too old and too damaged to actually identify anyway. Uh, but more pi pictures of the different views of the insect, flipping it over, things like that, could actually help. <laughs> yep. Um, yep, it's a very tough one, but at least a couple better pictures, better lighting, things like that could have helped. Close to home here, both in time and space, a Wake County photograph that was sent in April this month. What would be the main criticism here? It's dark, and in particular, the lighting, but more specifically, here we're talking about why is it dark? It's the contrast. We've got a very light background and a very dark specimen. So if they had chosen maybe a less cluttered, of course the paper, the line paper give us a size reference, but I don't think that's in question here with a pine tree, a more neutral background, a gray or a medium colored blue that wouldn't have been so much lighter than the sample and tricked the exposure into underexposing the picture that we wanted. Okay, how about this picture? Yep, the size reference would have been nice. Uh, always size references are nice. Uh, you, do, you don't want to obscure the actual insect when you're putting the size reference in there. Um, but anything else? No, this is actually a really good photo. Um, you can tell basically what host it is. It would be nice to get some photos zoomed out of the whole plant. Um, it's a it's a brass casing. It's some kind of cabbage. Um, uh, I don't know exactly what host. I'm sure they just send it, submit it with the notes, but we know what type of plant it is basically. Um, but yes, so we have two organisms here. We have the caterpillar, uh, which is a cabbage butterfly. And uh, we have these little cocoons, which are wasps that had parasitized this cabbage, this cabbage butterfly. So we've got some life history. Uh, we've got the host. We've got a fairly new focus, really nicely uh, balanced, white balanced. Uh, but again, could use a little bit of a size reference and uh, some pictures of the overall plant. But those, if they're sent in as notes on the sample, then uh, we've got a pretty good idea of what it is. Now, pictures of the head and the legs might have been a little bit better, but since this is a fairly common pest, we can uh, pretty easily tell what it is. Here's another picture from this month, this one from down near the coast. The host is Camellia. It was one of several pictures that were sent in for the sample. And the main problem, of course, is the focus. There's also a little bit of glare there. And sometimes by playing with the shading where you stand, where you put the sample in relation to the light, you can get a better picture in that respect. Maybe a bit darker background so that it wouldn't contrast. In this case, there was no photograph taken of the underside of the leaf, which would be good. Even with those limitations, not to say that we can always 
make the most out of a, a difficult photograph, but in this case, I was fairly sure that it was not the fungus. They were concerned whether it was a fungus or a virus, and in this case, it does look like what is known as chameleon leaf yellow model virus has also, also been called chameleon infectious variegation virus, chameleon color breaking virus, chameleon variegation virus. There is, as far as I know, technically nothing officially called chameleon ring spot virus, but that is probably what this was based on the photographs. Okay, a couple more insights. Uh, how about this photo? Yes, yeah, size. Uh, we're zoomed out a little bit too far to tell exactly what it is. We could tell a little bit of the shape, but there are numerous insects that are brown about that size. And I'm assuming this is a uh, poster note, but I don't know if it's a poster board either. So it's a little bit it's tough to tell. You know, standard size references are good. Um, so getting up close will get body shape better. Uh, getting in focus is better. Uh, it does have the time stamp, if that's correct, which will tell us the time of year. Uh, but I imagine this is probably from a household. And so it could be any time of year, basically, that these, some of these issues occur. Um, generally, not a great photo. Uh, very difficult to tell. And I could make some assumptions, but I don't want to do that. So uh, sending in the specimen in this case, or getting a little bit closer up or with a magnifying glass, things like that. And also, it's, it's sometimes a little bit obscured in the plastic. So uh, take it out, put it on some paper. If you're really worried about it, this should suffice. Uh, but um, in general, you can put it on some paper. Or like I said, if, it's, if you think it's going to fly away before you can take a photo, put it in a bag, freeze it, kill it, and put it on some paper. Uh, and then take some multiple photos. Okay, another one of mine. Uh, what do people think about this? Okay, so it definitely has a good size reference. Got the penny in there. Um, using American coins is obviously a little bit better because we have uh, an idea of how big they are. Um, this is a little bit dark, but not too bad. I uh, could have a couple more close-ups of the larvae, but actually that is the situation too. These were from soil, and these are March fly larvae, um, and they can cause damage to roots of plants, but they do live in the soil, so we know it's in the soil. We have multiple specimens here. Uh, we have a size reference. I uh, just could have used a couple closer photos, but in general, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, again, with larvae, you want to get pictures of the head and the body above and below to see the legs, because that can tell you what type of insect it is. Because uh, these could look like caterpillars, um, but they're, de they're fly larvae, and they wouldn't have legs. OK, I think I have one last one. Okay, this one's from Stokes County in 2009. Okay, yep, so the uh, proximity, so it's not very close. Now, we have a good size reference, obviously. Um, and yes, a definitely larger photo. This is the actual size of the photo sent in. Uh, fortunately, I could probably guess what that is and figure out. It's a sap beetle um, uh, in a specific genus that looks like that. But it's tricky because there are some other beetles that look like that, or I could be mistaken. Uh, by this photo and think I'm seeing certain things, but really it's something else. Uh, yes, so the situation would be great to know. Uh, lo hopefully that's described in when the report is put in. Uh, somebody says, this is found uh, in my bed, this is found on my squash, something like that. Um, the color is all right, actually. That is a black specimen. That should be, if that's what it is. But again, I would have my uh, reservations about making a positive ID on something like this um, without better photos. Uh, because again, I don't really want to make a mistake that thinking, say, I know this is the head right here, but with the photo, it may have been this is the head or things like that. And it's very difficult to see the legs or antennae or anything like that. Okay. 
All right, and pass it over to Mike then, last part. Just one last slide in this section to point out two different things when you are uploading photos to our database. You're probably familiar now with this file attachments tool halfway down the sample submission page, but I just want to make sure that you notice two things. One is this little bit here, max size 10 megabytes. Now that's approximate, but it's important not to overload with a lot of big photos. What will happen is you'll hit submit and everything will look fine, but at our end, it's a blank sample. We get no pictures. We get no information. The only thing we know is the login ID of the person who generated it. So we have to do the detective work and figure out who sent it in, send them a message saying, hey, this happened. Please try again. So watch out for overloading the system. The other thing is you will see here all files submitted to the PDIC may be used for teaching purposes and in online image libraries. So you are basically giving permission when you upload those pictures for us to use it on plants, pests, and pathogens, possibly embarrassing you in the future or in our classroom teaching and so forth. So I just wanted you to be aware of both of those disclaimers or alerts on our file attachments tool. And with that, we'll take any questions that you have about our photography question, how do you make the photos smaller? And where do those white fuzzy things on the limb? OK. Uh, I, I guess I can answer both those questions. So before those white fuzzy things on the limb, that was the beech blight aphid. So they, they, do col they do have colonies, and they produce this wax filament to create that fuzziness. Um, so again, with the host, the beech, and the aphids like that, it's fairly diagnostic. You probably wouldn't even need a very close-up photo. But again, it's very difficult for uh, the layperson to tell whether you need more photos. So just take as many as possible, um, you know, with, within reason to Mike's graph that he made. Um, now, as far as how to make them smaller, uh, there are a number of ways to do that. You can set the size of the images on your camera to begin with. Uh, but you can also use photo editing software like Photoshop, um, anything almost. You can open up photos in Microsoft Paint and then reduce the size if you go to edit, say, and reduce the size by percentage, say 50%. Um, so many ways to do it. There's some online softwares that are freeware, uh, like Photoshop. Uh, I forget what some of them, what the names are. Um, I think GIMP is one of them, and that's a free, basically free Photoshop. Um, there's a couple online ones that you just do all the stuff online. But uh, those are ways to reduce the size of the image files. Right, Johnson County here talks about using an iPhoto. Pretty mm -hmm. much any of your image viewing programs, both on the Mac and the PC, have this feature when you to save as to be able to downsample is a technical term for it to a lower resolution. So it's the when we talk about a picture being larger or smaller, we're really talking about the resolution or how many pixels mm -hmm. are describing the picture. Yeah, most of those, most of even the uh, Windows programs like the window, the viewer, you just they usually have very simple editing software, crop. Um, resize, maybe a little bit of tint and things like that. Not as powerful as Photoshop, uh, but most of those softwares you can find using the edit, uh, edit menu. Going back to Michelle's question about using the photos for teaching for your purposes, it appears that our, our disclaimer is general. So assuming that you have access to the sample, which would be if you're the agent on that sample, in this case Michelle, then it would appear that you're covered. All right. I think that's a great comment, Doug, at the end there. Most digital cameras come packaged with some simple software that many folks ignore, and also many features that people ignore, like who was the comment that we only use 10% of our brains. I think we only use about 10% of the capabilities of our digital cameras as well. Mm -hmm. All right, hand it back over to you. OK, Lucy. thank you very much. Gentlemen, really appreciate all those good tips and, and strategies.
the have a hand up from Lee. Is it maybe that Lee, did you have a question? Okay. Maybe an applause for you guys. Okay, next up we we've got the showstopper, but before I introduce Mark, everybody just take a second and stand up and and stretch and turn around because we've hit the one hour mark and it's good for everybody to move for a minute. Once you've had a chance to do that, then we're gonna flip over to Mark Blevins, who's now the county director in Brunswick County, and he is back with us to talk about showstopper plants. Welcome, Mark. Thanks a lot, Lucy. Lucy Bradley, everybody. <laughs> You shake my nerves and you rattle my roots. And too much love makes a gardener wear boots. You flowers still. Oh, what a thrill. Goodness gracious, fireball hibiscus. With dazzling blooms the size of dinner plates from June through August and tropically textured foliage to a height of four feet, fireball hardy hibiscus makes a bold statement in gardens like yours. Thriving in our Carolina heat and humidity, surviving winters as cold as Zone 5. Brr. Hey, place this showstopper in full sun with evenly moist soil to get a happy plant and an even happier gardener when the distinctively purple veins show up amid deeply dissected leaves. A big thanks to the North Carolina Nursery and Landscape Association for working with Cooperative Extension to promote this and other promising new cultivars and ironclad plants to innovative gardeners like those listening today. Goodness gracious, fireball hibiscus. That's all, folks. <laughs> Wow, that uh, is going to be a hard act to follow. I'm going to have to work in some music into the pathogens portion of this in future months. But we'll have to go with the pedantic and uh, boring program that we have in store for you. So grab a cup of coffee and get ready for some diseases. This is a cherry laurel sample that came into the clinic this month from a commercial landscape here in Wake County. And I want to really emphasize the idea that seeing dieback, seeing leaf spots, and like we see here, dead areas on the margins and tips of the leaves doesn't mean that there's a pathogen right in the leaf itself. We often see these kind of symptoms where there's a problem lower down on the plant, either in the vascular system at the base or in the roots or soil. And that was the case here. If we look down farther, we can see that there was a canker at the base of the plant. And notice there was a dead branch there where that canker was starting. And if we cut it off at the soil line, we see that typical discoloration, almost a V pattern here in this case, where the wood was dead. This turned out to be Cytospora canker, which is caused by a fungus. Now, cankers in general, remember the definition is a dead area on a woody plant part. Sometimes you can tell because there are cracks on the surface of the bark or a sunken area or a swelling or even a target-shaped area where the canker tried to heal over and wasn't able to. But sometimes it's not really obvious and you have to shave into the bark and see that the wood is dead or the cambium is dead underneath. So I'm going to use this as a lead-in to talk a little bit about canker diseases in general, since we do have quite a few of them. The fungal cankers include quite a few. There's the Cytospora canker, which you saw here on a prunus species, but there's also one that gets on especially the Colorado spruces and causes a lot of problems for them. Our famous ceridium canker on Leyland cypress, generally only killing twigs, small portions of the ends of the branches. Glomerella canker on camellia, pretty famous. Botrytis canker on rose, likewise. Fomopsis on many different hosts. Pitch canker on pines. And there are a couple of bacteria cankers as well. Fire blight, probably the most famous, but we also have a pseudomonas canker on stone fruits. So a lot of pseudomonas dieback and, and canker on the, um, I wouldn't say a lot, but there was some on our nursery woody ornamentals this year. But of course, within that fungal category, our most important bacterial, I'm sorry, fungal category of woody plants in North Carolina is Botrysphyria canker. 
caused by the fungus known as Botrysphyria. There are a couple of different species. Botrysphyria dothidi, probably the most common. Here it is showing the symptoms of a flagging branch on redbud. And here we can see something like the outline of the canker. We better again to shave off there to see where exactly is the limit because we want to get, as a sample, several inches on either side of that transition zone between the healthy and the dead wood because that's where the fungus is going to be most active. We want to incubate this whole thing and watch for the fruiting bodies of the fungus to come out in the moist chamber over a several day period. Again, we notice this here, a little branch stub. Very often this is the place where canker fungi are able to enter the planet. We see Botrysphyria on a number of different hosts. The most common ones that we get here in the clinic are azalea and rhododendron, also arborvitae and leyland cypress. Those would be the most common finds. There are a couple of species of ilex that we do tend to see it on, Japanese holly and inkberry being those two, and on Japanese maple. It may not compete in terms of numbers, but in terms of damage it can be quite serious on other hosts as well, such as blueberry, red bud you saw in the picture previously, and interestingly enough, nyssa or black gum. Fortunately though, the management of fungal canker diseases is pretty much the same for all of them. One is you want to avoid unnecessary wounds to the plant. Another, if drought stress is a problem, then we want to make sure our plants are getting adequate moisture. Stress allows plants or causes plants to be more susceptible to cankers. We want to avoid cold injury. Does that mean we out run out and throw a blanket on plants all the time? Well, not necessarily, but we do want to make sure that we allow them to go dormant in the fall. You don't want to do hard pruning and get a flush of growth before cold weather sets in. Likewise, you don't want to load up on the fertilizer going into the winter because we want the plants to go into normal dormancy. Whenever you're pruning out cankers, make sure to go several inches into clean wood, maybe six inches or more, and always to a node so you're not leaving a stub that could become infected. In the process, be sure and sanitize your shears or knives with a 10% solution of household bleach or else 70% rubbing alcohol as it comes out of the bottle just to make sure you're not spreading the fungi around on the tools. And of course, if you've got a chance to intervene at that level, make sure that to encourage people to use plants that are adapted to their climate and their soils so that they won't be under stress and more susceptible to cankers. Now if we take this particular cherry laurel sample that we looked at where it was cut off at the soil line and then split the wood open, we can see that there's some discoloration happening. Wait, 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 wait. In the what else is there? What's this? What? Do you see anything else? What's right here? What's right here? Look at that. Well, we have an insect. <laughs> This is my purview, I guess. Um, and this is actually a boring insect. And if we look at it closer, this is a boring caterpillar. Not, well, it is kind of boring, but it's also boring in the wood. And uh, this is actually a peach tree borer. Uh, so not only are there cankers, but there are caterpillars boring in the root, the heart of the root. Uh, just under the surface of the bark, uh, but causing fairly large holes. Now, I, I should have put a size reference up here, but it's almost about the thickness of a pencil, almost, from uh, across. So, fairly large mature larvae were found in here. Two larvae were found in this. Well, as it turns out, Cytospora canker, one of the recommendations is to make sure you don't have insect injury. So keeping your insects under control, in this case this one is a primary pest, will help you with your canker problems as well. But where we're going with this picture was notice the roots. Always look at the roots. And we do have root rot going on here. And it turns out that this particular sample was positive for Phytophthora root rot when it was plated in the laboratory. And you can see the interesting hyphae of the fungus as it grew out in culture and even the sporangium. These are microscope shots, so you would see this with the naked eye, but it allows us in the lab to say, yep, that was Phytophthora root rot. Interestingly enough, since 
we've been in this particular format of plant specimen pathogens now in our fourth year, is that right? We have never talked about Phytophthora root rot in detail. And the reason for that isn't that it's uncommon, it's one of our most common diseases out in the landscape, but it's because it's one that you wouldn't be able to diagnose or identify on site. Symptoms on the above ground parts of the plant would be things like dieback of twigs, leaf drop, yellowing of leaves, leaves that are too small or smaller than normal. And again, always look at the roots to see if there's a root problem. But these are the kinds of things that you're going to suspect a root problem. Could be nematodes too in a picture like this you would suspect maybe. But it's where you're going to have to have a sample sent to the clinic in order to be able to get a confirmed diagnosis. Here's a sample that came in this month, and I wanted to ask this question. Not what's wrong with the picture so much, but what's wrong with the sample the way it was sent in? I mean, let's venture a guess. Of course, it does look like it was scrunched a little bit in the box that it was sent in, but that wasn't the problem. Uh, interesting. Someone suggested it might rot in the bag. It was actually the opposite problem here. This bag is flimsy, one of those uh, bags that come from the grocery store, and the roots poked holes in it. Turns out that a week passed between when the sample was taken and when it finally reached us, and that root ball had dried out quite a bit, which is disadvantageous for trying to look for either fungi or fungus-like organisms such as Phytophthora or nematodes. Now, this turned out to be negative for Phytophthora, and we sent off a subsample for nematode analysis at the uh, nematode assay lab here at North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. So basically, the better thing to do would have been use a sturdier bag, tie it around the base of the plant here, but then put the whole thing into another bag. Don't add additional water. We don't want it to be going anaerobic or rotting away on root, but nor do we want it to dry out. I see that I missed the question. Uh, how do we grow it in culture when we're looking for phytophthora? Well, the assay basically consists of washing the roots out and sticking them into a petri plate with agar media. But these agar media are amended with different antibiotics and fungicides to eliminate other things that might grow more quickly and obscure our view of the phytophthora. So it's selective in that case, or at least semi-selective, and only allows certain fungi to grow that when we identify them under the microscope, we can tell what they are. That's the, the process in a nutshell. And those of you who have come through the clinic on the tours have seen how we do that. Phytophthora root rot is, again, very common. It has a wide host range. The host that we see it most on is boxwood here in the clinic. We also see it a lot on azaleas and rhododendrons. Arborvitae and Leyland cypress are hosts as well. Sounds starting to sound familiar. Those, uh, the second and third on the list were also on our list of favorite hosts of Botrysphyria canker. But there are actually many, many different woody hosts that Phytophthora root and crown rot will get on. Now, some of you are also familiar with what Phytophthora can do on some of our herbaceous plants, such as some of the petunias and, of course, famously Madagascar periwinkle. But we're talking right now specifically about Phytophthora root and crown rot. Crown rot. And I made reference to the fact that we call this a fungus-like organism. People who are purists and uh, like to split hairs in that way not criticizing because it's valid. They're not really true fungi, evolutionarily speaking. But ecologically speaking, they act like fungi, so I don't have any problem calling them that. They do appreciate having excess water, though. We call them water mold sometimes, both Phytophthora and Pythium. They persist in the soil, so once you've got it, you're going to have a problem in the future. And once a plant is infected, that infection is incurable. So what is a person to do? Well. The foundation of Phytophthora management and prevention are these four bricks. You want to make sure that the site has good drainage. So elevation above the surrounding landscape is important, raised beds, in other words. It has a tremendous effect on how Phytophthora is able to cause damage. Good drainage, less Phytophthora. Along with that, soil amendments, things like 
pine bark amendment for soil that will both improve aeration, drainage, may have some beneficial effects on the soil microbial population and so on. We want to avoid excess water. If you've got an irrigation system that's on a timer and it doesn't know that it's raining or not raining and getting too much water, or if you're watering for the turf and the landscape plants are getting saturated, these are all going to be favoring Phytophthora. And then the fourth element would be plant selection. And by plant selection, I really mean two different things. One is what plant you choose based on the site having Phytophthora. If you know that Phytophthora is present, you want to choose a species that is going to be either resistant or tolerant to the Phytophthora. The other aspect of plant selection, of course, is make sure you don't put an infected plant into the landscape in the first place. Take a close look at your roots before you even stick it in the ground. We have a lot more information about this particular aspect of what plants to choose, where Phytophthora has been diagnosed, as well as a summary of some of these cultural practices at our publication 747. And I'll put the link there in the chat box as well so that you can make reference to that. So let's talk about what's going to be coming up in the next couple of months. Things are going to get really busy out there, not only for the gardeners, but for the pests and pathogens. So go to our quiz mode here and make this an A through D, multiple choice. For those of you who are not sure, if you look and cross from, let's see, this portion of the, right across there on the screen, you should see the buttons that allow you to choose A through D as the answer. And that will allow us to see how the polling is going. So rather than type it, don't type it into the chat box, well, wherever it is, because you can actually move these around, <laughs> modules on Collaborate. But there's a place where you can get a drop-down selection between A, B, C, and D. I see four folks have found it, seven have found it. So if you haven't found it yet, look next to where the hand raising and the smile icon are, and you'll see where you can choose to make your choice on the poll. All right. Mike, you got a question about pH and Phytophthora? Uh, Phytophthora is a problem in the low desert where pH is over 8. That, that, is that a comment? That's a comment to the question above it, which is, is raising pH recommended in the home garden oh, Phytophthora management? Yeah, that, that is not among our strategies that we would. You want to make sure your pH is optimized for the plant that you're working with, you're growing. So there are a few cases where we use pH to manage diseases such as scab on potato, but in this case, no. All right, let's see what we got as far as the poll goes here. Hopefully everyone can see this now. Wow, 36 of 58 did not respond. So I'm, I'm assuming that that's because you couldn't find the button, but keep looking for that because there are more questions coming. And in fact, the majority are correct that we have, in this case, powdery mildew on the Coreopsis. Very typically with the white patches, sometimes more diffuse than others. And remember, the powdery mildew can occur on either the upper surface, the lower surface, or both. Also, sometimes it's a little bit hard to see. For example, on dogwood in the spring, it looks pretty good and easy. But in the heat of the summer, you have to kind of hold it up at an angle to the light to see that powdery mildew there. It's much less conspicuous. I was asked actually a while ago, and never got around to addressing it, what about using baking soda to control powdery mildew? So I did a little workup here to explain some of what is going on in that area. Baking soda, as you may know, is the chemical compound sodium bicarbonate. But it turns out it does have some effectiveness against powdery mildew. And it's been marketed not as sodium bicarbonate with a different chemical composition slightly, replacing the sodium with potassium. So potassium bicarbonate as a fungicide. And these are some of the different names that you'll see out there. Armacarb, I don't know if that's a play on arm and hammer. 
uh, Cali Green, Millstop, Green Cure, Biocarb, Old Fashioned Fungicide. So these things are out and available. I couldn't tell you really which ones are available to the home grower, though. So I, I owe you that. Maybe some of you folks will know better than I. These are not just dusted on the plants. They are dissolved in water and applied to the foliage. The active concentrations are somewhere in the 5 to 20 grams per liter range. So again, check the labels for any specifics on that. And typical intervals would be a 7 to 14 day application to try and keep the powdery mildew at bay. The question, of course, that people want to know is, does it work? And it turns out there have been a lot of studies done with many different crops, with grapes, with dogwoods, with roses, but mostly with cucurbit powdery mildew. And they have found that these do work, especially if they're used with a spray oil or other adjuvant. The combining with the spray oil really enhances the, enhances the effectiveness of these bicarbonate salts in controlling powdery mildew. And depending on the study, and the conditions under which it was done, you get control that can range from modest up to excellent, comparable with some of the conventional fungicides. People want to use these, of course, because they are softer products that are not expected to be as toxic to the environment and, of course, not to the applicator as well. It's not an either or, though. These can be used in rotation with conventional fungicides, including a conventional so fungicide application from time to time during the uh, season, and that will also help you get control. Let me warn you, I haven't tried these myself. I read up on what has been done. I can't quite make recommendations because I don't have the experience, but I will mention that our 2013 version of the North Carolina Agricultural Chemicals Manual does mention one or more of these different products for use in ornamentals and different types. It's interesting that in the cucurbit disease control section, it is not mentioned, although if you look at the labels, some of these products, actually all the ones I checked, do have labels for use on cucurbits as well. But because our folks who do diseases on vegetables are not included in the North Carolina Ag Chemicals recommendation, I'm stopping short of making a specific recommendation. The question also comes up, what about other diseases? If this is good for powdery mildews, what about our other plant diseases? And it has been looked at not as extensively for other things. Of course, you can imagine the powdery mildew being on the surface, or much of the fungus is on the surface of the leaf. It's more susceptible, more prone to the effects of the treatment. But there have been mixed results with other diseases. In particular, there is a thought elaborated by Dr. Mark Windham at the University of Tennessee that for control of black spot on roads, this can work, but not in our area. He talks about the baking soda line, and he even has a map and draws it somewhere between New York and Delaware. It kind of moves upward toward the coast. North of that line, they do get results controlling black spot on roads with this uh, kind of compound. South of that line, where we are, it is not effective. So if you listen to Mark, then you would not expect it to have any great benefit on black spot of rose in our area. All right, go back to our polls here. Again, you're looking for a little button that has a little A in the square. It's fairly small, but it should be on the left side of your screen. See what you think this is. like almost 20 folks have found the buttons. That's good. And the polling is yes, those who answered are overwhelmingly correct. This is downy mildew of impatiens. It'll be interesting to see how many impatiens get planted out this year, how many of course are going to reseed themselves, but we will probably get another round of this disease again this year. There is no recommendation of any control in the landscape other than removing the plants. 
still at this point as far as I know. And it can be very devastating as you can see from this picture that Paige provided us in June of last year. So inpatients down in Milk. How about this one? I should I should come up with a, a song or something to sing during the intervals here, where people are using their mice to enter their results, or at least some banter of some kind. All right, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and or show the uh, poll results here. A little bit more even break. All right, a little bit more doubt on this situation. But it turns out this is both downy mildew and powdery mildew. You can see the powdery mildew as the white to gray patches on the leaf. The downy mildew are the yellowish spots that then turn into angular dead spots. And you would only expect to see under humid conditions the sporulation of that fungus on the underside. But the symptoms of the disease, the yellowing and the dark necrotic spots, especially angular, are going to show up on the upper surface as well. This is an interesting disease because we don't know from year to year when it's going to arrive in North Carolina. So it'll be interesting to see. June is typical. Could be early June, could be late June. We may not see really widespread problems until July, perhaps. But it's something to definitely keep an eye out for. And I'm talking about the uh, downy mildew. The powdery mildew, of course, is uh, it doesn't have to blow up from the south as the downy mildew does, which doesn't overwinter here. Here, I'll just let you type it into the uh, box what you think this might be. Michelle, is there a list of veggie-resistant plants? Not that I know of. Um, I will have to do a little bit more looking into that. But I know that there is some information online. And of course, catalogs will tell the resistance or not of their vegetable varieties. But when folks go to buy seed, that information is often available, or at least the claims to it. But when folks go and pick transplants uh, at the garden center, I don't know if they're going to even necessarily know what kind of disease resistance they're, they're getting or not getting. All right, Ron has correctly indicated that this is slime mold. This is our common Fuligoseptica, very aptly named the dog vomit slime mold that will be showing up on hardwood mulches, especially in the coming warmer months. It is not dangerous. Uh, some people may be allergic to the spores, but you can stick your finger in this. And it may not be appetizing, but it's not going to be harmful to you or your garden. Ron, did you have a question or a point that you wanted to make? I see your hands up. OK. Well, if you do, just chime in or type it in. That'd be fine. All right, running quickly through these because I am a little over time. Coming soon to an oak near you. Tried to throw you off a little bit on this one. We won't wait to do the poll. But this is oak leaf bis blister caused by the fungus Tephrina cerulins. And it causes first a light green blister, which would be the early spring symptom. But then as the year Whereas on we get into June, we get the death of those spots. And it gives the illusion that the disease is spreading or getting more severe on the tree. But it's already done its job for the year. It's already infected. And no further infections are taking place because that all happens while the leaves are, are young and still not hardened. So no point in treating. It would, be, uh, it would be unhelpful at that time of year. And we wouldn't recommend it anyway. It's an aesthetic problem and not going to cause any long-term damage to the health of the tree. But oak leaf blister, some years are quite bad for it, and you'll certainly see them if you haven't already. Other things to watch for in May and June, we already talked about phytophthora diseases. Those will often be active when things are wet, but the symptoms show up when the weather gets hot and dry, and we start getting stress, and there's not enough roots to supply the plant's needs. So symptom appearance and disease activity may not necessarily coincide. 
powdery mildew we mentioned in dog vomit slime mold and mulch, also root knot nematode, be watching the roots of your, your plants, your bedding plants and your vegetables. In woody ornamentals, don't forget, we'll be getting into our period of normal leaf shed of the oldest leaves on magnolia, holly, pines, of course, depending on, on the species and the individual may shed at different times, but evergreen needles and leaves or an evergreen tree does not mean that each leaf and needle is immortal. They do shed after a few years of service to the tree. Oak leaf blister we mentioned. Rose rosette will be coming now. It'll be interesting to see how widespread it is this year. And quince rust on ornamental pear, service berry, and some other things. We saw a picture of that in our photography section. Flower beds, if we have impatience, I'm expecting we'll also have impatience downy mildew. Again, it'll be interesting to see how much occurs. And of course, we'll be having root and stem rot, Spithium, Rhizoctonia, and Sclerosum rolfsii shown in this photograph here. You won't always see the nice mycelium. That will be after it reaches a certain point of development and if you've got humid, moist conditions. Among fruits, fire blight and leaf curl should already be active, but we'll continue to see problems with them in the near future. Peach scab, as the fruit are starting to develop, we'll be seeing the spots on them uh, from this particular disease as well. The two nemeses of tomatoes and peppers in the garden will be beginning their reign of terror starting next month and going into the summer. Tomato spotted wilt virus in the small insert picture there, which can be confused with some other foliar diseases, and southern bacterial wilt, which is pictured on the right, although of course wilting like that could also be southern stem blight. Sometimes it takes a, a sample to come into us before we can distinguish them. The difference between those two being the tomato spotted wilt virus is random and capricious, whereas bacterial wilt is in the soil and a recurring problem where it has infested. We will see probably cucurbit down in mildew coming in at some point before we next join you on plant stress and pathogen, so keep an eye out for that if and when it occurs. And glyphosate injury, of course, will be happening where people have been careless with their applications. In turf, keep an eye out for brown patch of tall fescue, for large patch of the warm season turf grasses, and for fairy rings on any kind of turf. And with apologies to Matt, because I've gone well over time here, let me... Mike, you have a quick question for symptoms of rose rosette. Symptoms of rose rosette. All right. Foliage that stays red instead of turning green. Of course, it normally will be red at the beginning of as it's just emerging from the bud, but if it doesn't turn back green, if it develops a witch's broom, leaf distortion, could be flower distortion, the most diagnostic symptom would be excess or hyperthorniness, 100 times more thorns on the stem than would be normal. Also stems that are really flexible, you can bend them over against themselves and they don't snap and increased susceptibility to cold injury. So after a couple of years of being infected, those, those rose bushes will be, will be history. We did a blog. If you go back and look at our clinic blog on that, we have some further information on that disease and the symptoms and how it spreads and what can be done about it. Thank you. Thank you. All yours, Matt. OK, great. Thanks, Mike. Okay, um, so this is my first plant space pathogens. I, uh, I'm not going to have a lot of uh, uh, advice about what's coming up recently in the future, but I'll tell you what's going to be coming around now or in the next couple months before our next uh, webinar. But the big news, of course, this year is Brood 2, Return of the Cicadas. These uh, cicadas are the periodical cicadas that have been in the ground for 17 years. Uh, this is species Magis cicada septum decim. And uh, they were last seen in 1996. And I won't tell you where I am to div divulge my age. Um, but uh, they've been feeding on the roots of trees as nymphs right now uh, since then. And uh, they're coming out this year. Uh, just to look out for, if you want to find more information on these broods, uh, this website, magisticata.org, is a very good one. And the next North Carolina broods will be the 17-year ones in 2017, 2020, 21, 25, and a 13-year brood in 2024. Um, 
But as far as this brood this year, uh, here's a map of where the activity is going to has been historically found and is probably likely to be found this year uh, if they haven't been paved over or things like that. Um, quick show of hands or uh, or if you want to let us know if you've been seeing them, you can just uh, indicate somehow. I'm, I'm not sure how. Uh, but uh, if you're living in the basically in the north to northwest central or northwest of the state, you may find these, you may see these. Um, and they should be emerging right now and starting to emerge. Um, now the mature nymphs will emerge in large numbers and they'll create these holes from the ground and sometimes they even create turrets like tube mud tubes that look similar to crayfish tunnels. Um, and uh, they'll start crawling up on trees where since they're mature they will emerge as adults and uh, sit on their skin and this is where you find all the cicada skins usually for the annual cicadas, but you'll find many, many more of these on the trees and the adults drying, uh, waiting to become hardened and be able to go and mate. So uh, these cicadas then will mate. The females will lay eggs using their saw-like ovipositor. They'll drill into branches and lay eggs. Um, and over 70 species of trees and shrubs are attacked. Uh, some of their favorites are oak, hickory, honey locust, dogwood, apple, and peach. Uh, and the adults will be doing this will be mating, making sounds uh, for about four weeks. Um, now, if you go to themagiccicada.org, you can find some sounds. Basically, it's going to sound you, you'll know. I mean, they're going to be out. They're going to be about these are large insects, and they're very loud. Uh, and especially with the millions upon millions that are going to be uh, coming out, they're going to be very loud, and they sound like kind of a spaceship. Um, it's kind of like a wee wee wee. I don't think that's a very good, uh, uh, <laughs> a very good uh, 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 imitation of it. But uh, anyway, you can go on to magiccicada.org and find some of the sounds that you'll see. They also have defensive sounds. If you were to pick one up, they'll they'll uh, kind of snap and kind of crackle, make little clicking sounds. This will help them avoid predators. Um, but many of them will be eaten by animals, local animals, and they are an important food source for uh, many predators, dogs, uh, wild uh, things, uh, wild animals will be eating them. Uh, but there will be enough to survive and mate and lay eggs. Now, through the egg laying of the females, uh, they start to leave gouge marks on thin twigs and uh, the tips of branches. Uh, and this will cause flagging. It will cause the death of the branch uh, above this section where the eggs have been laid. Now, if you've got mature trees, this will not permanently hurt the plants. These twigs will, these flags will fall off and the eggs will hatch and the larvae will either drop from the tree or drop from the twig that's on the ground and burrow into the ground right below the tree and suck on the roots. Now, if you have saplings that are small and have very small branches, enough of this flagging can be detrimental to the actual saplings. So um, maybe pay attention in the future years for years where they're going to come out and not plant saplings right beforehand. But you, since they are large insects, you could probably take them off yourself or you could put a little bit of netting over the saplings and this could help uh, deter or keep protected the, the saplings from the cicadas. Otherwise, there's nothing to worry about. Uh, the, the trees will recover, basically just like pruning, uh, so you shouldn't really have to worry about them too much. Other than the annoyance, the sound, the mushiness of them when they're getting run over, things like that. Uh, but if you're not in that section of North Carolina, you probably won't even experience them. Okay, enough about mosquito, uh, cicadas. Now, flies. So uh, I know this is not everybody's favorite subject, but I have, uh, I'm have i a fly specialist. Uh, I also work on beetles too, so I'm really in love with beetles too. But uh, flies seem to get 
uh, the short end of the stick when it comes to pests and uh, just the overall diversity, a huge group of insects, over 150,000 described species in the world, very ecologically diverse, and very many medical pests and many agricultural pests too. So today's talk, I'm going to focus mostly on flies. Uh, flies that you're going to be seeing uh, in the near future, in the next month or two, this month and next month. And then I'm going to wrap up with another insect to talk about. But uh, let's get started on some flies. Okay. So a really interesting new fly uh, that's in North Carolina, so on the east coast of North America now, uh, is the daylily leaf mining fly. Now, I've seen lots of these on my daylilies out in my garden uh, in past years. Uh, I actually took this photo right here of a female puncturing the leaves. Uh, this is an agromyzid fly, uh, Ophiomyia quonsonis, and they attack the leaves of daylily. There are only two agromyzids that attack le uh, daylilies. One attacks the flowers and the seeds, and that's only in Japan. They don't find that here. But this other one that attacks leaves from Japan originally was found in the U.S. in 2006. Um, they're very small flies, about two to, six, two to three millimeters long, um, and, but black, and they hold their wings out uh, kind of uh, like a V. And they're very, they have a very uh, short, blunt ovipositor where they do jab into the plant. Now, what they will do is they'll lay eggs in the plant, and the larvae then tunnel in between the surfaces of the leaf. And, uh, and um, they basically tunnel long, and make long tunnels unless it's invested with several maggots. And then they'll start crossing uh, and making a lot of damage. And you'll basically get this, these silver trails. Um, then they'll, this is what the maggot looks like right here. They're very small. Uh, again, the, the fly is only two to three millimeters. It's about the same size for the, the maggot. Um, and they keep doing this tunneling until they're satiated, and then they'll pupate at the base of the leaf. Uh, the females also puncture leaves, as you see in the, I saw in the last picture, uh, to get, uh, they'll suck on the sap to get a little kind of quick drink. Uh, so these are all the dam this is the damage that they can cause. And I've seen dozens of them on my uh, day lilies uh, at one time. Now, it is just cosmetic damage. It doesn't kill the plant. Um, and these can be controlled by removing the damaged stems. If, you've got, uh, if you know there are maggots already mining in the leaves, remove, this, remove these leaves so that they don't pupate and become adults that are going to go reproduce on the plants later on in the season. However, it's very difficult to control them because there are so many uh, wild uh, daylilies out there. They're not wild, but um, feral kind of uh, daylilies out there. So there's a lot of uh, hosts for them to be in. Uh, however, just keep an eye out on these insects. If you're not so concerned with how, with a couple of these mines, things like that, uh, you may not want to have to do anything. But uh, they won't affect the flowers. Uh, so if that's what you're concerned about, then, then that's really not a problem. OK. Um, Another one that you may not think is a fly uh, is a gall midge called the maple eye spot gall. Uh, and this, this creates these galls, these character, characteristic round uh, bullseye galls on maple leaves. Uh, now, I couldn't find a picture of the adults because they are very ephemeral. They're only going to be around for a week or so. And they'll lay eggs in the newly expanding maple leaves. Uh, each larva then will create a little spot, and by the time you see the spot, the larva is probably gone and has dropped off into the soil to pupate and become an adult. Uh, so the good thing about this is that uh, they're really not detrimental to the plant. Uh, they're only there for a week or so feeding, and it's mostly cosmetic, and the incidence varies from year to year. So one year you may have lots of them on the leaves, other years you may not have any. Uh, so it's not really something to be controlled, and usually by the time you see the spots, they're already gone anyway. But well, here's a caveat. Yes, the caveat is this is Mike again. The caveat is that when those galls get older, they can get faded. They don't have necessarily as bright a bullseye appearance, and you don't want to confuse them with some of the other fungal diseases on maple leaves, particularly philosticta leaf spot, which can be quite circular also.
Yes. Yeah, so thanks, Mike. So you know they're not very similar. You're you know you're gonna they're very bright and conspicuous as far as the maple eye spot gall. Um, so you probably won't confuse it too much with uh, any of the bacterial fungal spots, but um, just be be sure that you're getting the right thing and send in some good photos of them if you if you're not sure. But again, not really anything to worry about. Uh, the tree is going to not suffer. It'll be fine. Uh, but it does give these crazy spots all over the leaves. Okay. Uh, now, most people, I think, a lot of people now are composting their veggies and their scraps, things like that, to add nice soil to their their gardens. Um, and people don't realize that flies are the most important composting insects. They are going to be the most common insects in compost, and they're doing the major amount of work in the compost bin. So you should really be thankful for flies because they are really good decomposers. Um, However, the adults may drift from the compost. And so it's good to know what, whether you have a pest infestation or if it's just your compost is too close to the house or they're, you know, it's a windy day, they're coming in your, in your doors if you open it. Now, there are uh, lots of other insects that will be in compost, things like cockroaches, uh, which I misspelled, uh, earwigs, beetles, and others, maybe some very microscopic, very small insects. But for the most part, flies are our major compost uh, organism. So some of the ones you're going to be seeing around compost are vinegar flies, or what people call fruit flies in their house. Uh, that is basically because a banana that's going ripe, overripe, and rotting is basically compost. And these flies, we call them vinegar flies rather than fruit flies, because true fruit flies attack really nice healthy fruit. Vinegar flies, Drosophila, uh, attack rotting fruit. And what they're looking for is actually the fungi, the yeasts and bacteria that are decomposing the fruit and other materials. And so they're very common in compost bins. And you can usually tell them by the red eyes. And they usually have this, this uh, plumose arista, this little hair that's very hairy on, on their antenna. A little difficult to see on small specimens, but you could see on larger ones. And usually they're this tan color with the red eyes. This one actually has some really hair, this hair in its eyes, really kind of cool. And these are the pupae of the, of, the, of the fruit fly, the vinegar fly. OK, another one are moth and drain flies. So these are common in people's bathrooms where they feed on the muck in pipes. Uh, but the muck in compost bins is just as good of an environment. So you get these little fuzzy flies that look like little moths. Uh, here's a larva and a pupa. Um, and they're going to be in the compost bin too. So again, if you see a, an abundance of these flies and it's near the compost, that's probably what they're coming from. Uh, one of the kind of scarier looking, but I, I very much love is uh, the black soldier fly, a very large fly that mimics wasps, a very beautiful eyes, but long antennae for a fly, uh, again, to mimic a wasp. Uh, the larvae are really hardened, flattened maggots, uh, legless. They've got a really little pointy head. Both of the, all of these are completely harmless. They don't bite. The adults don't even feed. And actually, if you look under the abdomen, there's a little window that you can look in where their fat bodies are. And over the time, those fat bodies reduce, and then they die. So the adults don't even need to feed. The larvae are amazing composters. There's actually this black soldier fly blog com talking about their uh, impact on compost. And they've actually been used to compost pig manure, things like that. They're very good flies to have around, though they do, the adults will sometimes get stuck in houses and resemble wasp. So be on the lookout. Again, it's completely harmless, um, but does mimic a wasp to gain a little bit of protection. OK, darkwing fungus gnats, which are common in homes when uh, you have potted plants that are overwatered, things like that, or in mushroom production. But because they're feeding on compost and soil, they're going to be common in compost bins too. So they have little white worm-like um, larvae with a little black head. And the adults are very characteristic in that they're small. They usually have dark gray or black wings. And they have this very characteristic fork-shaped vein in the middle of the wing. All of them will have that. And they're very common. They're probably one of the most common flies in this situation. Uh, again, completely harmless. All, most of these flies are, are harmless to people. Um, 
You have also black scavenger flies, minute black scavenger flies. This is actually window screening. That is how small these flies are. Uh, this is a mating pair. They look kind of like dark winged fungus gnats, but they're more compact. They have more compact antennae, and they're usually a little more solid looking. Uh, shorter legs, bigger bodies, things like that. Um, they are also common, and you will often see the female dragging the male around while they're mating uh, haphazardly. So that male is kind of going along for a ride. But you can tell how small they are. These, this is window screening, like I said. And lastly, you have house flies and relatives that will breed in compost. And this could include biting stable flies, which look almost exactly like house flies, except have a long, hard proboscis, which they use to bite. Now, if they're biting you, you're obviously going to know that they're there. Uh, but these aren't very often. They're usually more associated with uh, manure composting, manure and hay. But you will get flies like house flies around compost. Um, and that's it for the composting. Uh, so just be on the lookout if you're wondering where an abundance of these flies are coming from. Now, you won't get blow flies or flesh flies, the, the, really, the blow flies being the green, metallic green flies that come into homes, because those flies are feeding on meat and carcasses. Unless you're trying to compost a lot of carcasses, which uh, we won't ask questions, but um, the, you know, that's, that's where you can get those from. If it's just vegetable compost, these are the flies you're going to be seeing. Okay. Another fly to be on the lookout for uh, in May is going to be the Narcissus bulb fly, which is uh, a type of hoverfly uh, in the family Cerfidae, uh, Meridon equestris. Now, these are originally from Europe. And as you notice, they are very good bumblebee mimics, as are many surfid hoverflies. Uh, and these affect bulb plants, so amaryllis, daffodil, daffodil being what it's named after the narcissus bulb fly, um, hyacinth, iris, uh, very many um, um, plants. Uh, if you do catch an adult, it has this very characteristic cell in the vein. It looks almost like somebody described as a sock. Um, but uh, it's a very large, bumblebee-looking like fly. And um, adults will emerge in May and mate. And then they'll take nectar of flowers, even the daffodils. Uh, the females will then lay eggs in the base of the leaves in the stem, uh, right above where the soil line is, basically. Um, and the females will produce 40 to 100 eggs per female. Um, and they'll hatch about two weeks later and feed. This is what the larva looks like. It's a big, grubby-looking maggot type thing. Uh, and then they'll pupate the next spring. So they actually have a very long life cycle. So they're going to overwinter as maggots in the bulbs. Um, so as far as some control and preventative measures, um, first thing you can do is cut old leaves in late spring and cover the bulbs with soil. This will protect the, the bulbs from uh, the fly from the females laying eggs uh, somewhat. You can also check and destroy infested bulbs so that you can reduce the population of the adults around. And you can also capture and kill females patrolling the bulb areas. And uh, since they're large flies, you can use an insect net or um, anything. I don't know, maybe a rubber band gun or a slingshot. I'm not sure. But uh, killing the adult females might help uh, keep the, the populations down. Now, if you do find infested bulbs, there is a way to possibly kill the maggots without killing the bulb. And this is to keep, put the, submerge them in a hot water bath. Oh, sorry, that should be 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so kept at about 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so uh, for about 40 minutes. And any higher could kill the bulb, but lower could let the maggots survive. So these are some ways to help protect your daffodils and irises and such. OK, now an interesting thing about hoverflies is that most of them are bee mimics or wasp mimics. And so this is actually a big confusion and very difficult in the garden setting to know, OK, is this insect a sting me? Is it a bee or a wasp? Or is it a fly that can't sting and can't bite uh, and is just mimicking to get protection? So I put over here a fairly drab hoverfly. Uh, and a kind of not so characteristic bee, but just to show some of the characters of kind of not very brightly colored ones. So you're not basing it just on patterns. So the flies are going to have very short antennae with a little hair coming off of it. 
And they're also going to have two wings, which are the four wings, which is characteristic of all flies. All flies only have two, at most two wings. Their hind wings are reduced in this little balancing organ called a halter. Um, it's a little knob. Now bees won't have that. And it's difficult to see here. It looks like it only has two wings, but they'll have four wings. Another thing is that bees will have long antennae with many segments, whereas the flies will only have very few segments usually. Uh, flies will also only have sponging mouth parts, whereas the bees will have biting mandibles and uh, basically a tongue for many of the bees to suck nectar. Um, so here's a pop quiz. Which one's the fly? Oh, thanks, Mike. I made this quiz a little, uh, I should have made it a little different, but maybe there's more than one fly. Or they're all wasps, I'm not sure. OK. Um, let's see. So people are saying B is the fly. OK. Do we want to see the results of that? Uh, there you go. OK, great. So um, yes, B is definitely a fly. You can see the halt ears right here, the two wings, the short antennae. Uh, C, some people said, that is actually a honeybee. Uh, you can see the long antennae, and you can see the one wing and the two wings. OK. Uh, D is a hornet. Uh, so it's got the long, multi-segmented antennae. Uh, hornets and paper wasps fold their wings long lengthwise, so it's hard to see the only the four wings. But you won't see those little knobs. However, A was the trick. And this is actually a trick, because there are two flies on this. This is actually also a hoverfly. You can see the halter right here, and you see the only the two wings. And this is one of the best mimics I've ever seen. This was on an oak in my front yard. And it has long antennae, but they're only made of a couple segments that have been lengthened. And also, the really great thing about this fly is it's been so well modified that even the wings are half black and half clear to mimic these long folded wings of hornets. So it actually fooled me for at first. But another thing you can do is look at how they fly. Bees and wasps are usually a little more, more clumsy flying. They're, they're going to buzz around. They're going to kind of sw swoop in like haphazardly. Uh, f hoverflies are extremely good flyers. They're going to hover around but, um, and be very controlled flyers. Um, so it just takes some time to see them and see their behavior to kind of understand the differences. OK. Um, and you're not alone. Anybody recognize this, please? So this is the North Carolina Zoo. And there's a honeybee barn. Well, this picture right here is actually of a fly on that flower, not a bee. Uh, again, two wings, short antennae. Very difficult for most people to tell the difference. And that's the point, is that these flies want to gain protection by thinking, making birds and other organisms think that they're bees and they're going to get stung. And even a little bit more embarrassing, the Bees of the World book has a fly on the front also. Uh, and I looked for this cover recently, uh, and they've changed it since, because it's fairly embarrassing that Bees of the World has a fly on the front of the cover. So you're not alone if you're tricked by these things. And again, that's the point. Um, now, one last thing. Not all hoverflies are, are, are uh, pests, like the Narcissus bulb fly. Many are going to be just feeding on rotting vegetation or in sewer systems, things like that. But there's a huge group of them, um, actually the bee in the quiz, that one is, would be one of them, where the larvae are caterpillar-like and green and live on plants where they feed on aphids. So they're, in fact, beneficial. So if you ever see these and wondering what this is, this little kind of spiny thing without a head, but looks almost like a caterpillar, that's a surfid or hoverfly larva. That's, yes, the B, letter B, not the B in the quiz. <laughs> um, 
And I like this picture because I took this on milkweed with uh, some aphids. And I like this because this aphid looks really freaked out and terrified that this giant worm is eating everything around it. And you also notice this one aphid has been parasitized by another uh, insect, and that's a wasp that has mummified this, this aphid. But these uh, hoverfly larvae will eat numerous aphids on the plants. Okay. Um, Matt, I'm wondering if we can save the the lice for the next um, plant specimen pathogens. We're after 12 already, and we haven't done any of, of the wrap-up announcements and things. Would, would, okay. Would it make sense for them to to be next time, or, or is it important that they go this time? No, it's not important. It's just a, a way to let, make people aware that they're what they're at, what they're looking at. So it, they're they're all around during the season. So we can do that next time. No problem. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the cool information about flies. Who knew flies were so cool? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. A couple of, of quick announcements. I know we're, um, Johnson County says they knew how cool flies were. Um, Sean and his team. I know we're a little bit over time, but let me just share with you real well, real quickly, some ways that you can stay in touch with late breaking news and what's happening. One of them is to join the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Volunteer listserv. So you can send me a note. I'd be happy to put you on that list. We have a website that is for the public, which is the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Volunteer org. So it's ncemgv.org, and that's our, our public place where we're posting information. We also have a private password protected area that's just available to Master Gardener volunteers. And that's ncsugarden.com. Another source for great information is the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Association. And they have a website, which is www.ncmastergardeners.org. They have lots of information there, including information about the upcoming conference. We're moving along with, with uh, the license plates for Master Gardeners. This is a great way for you to celebrate that you are an Extension Master Gardener. It's also a great way to help publicize the program to the public. If you don't, haven't already ordered your license plate, you can go to the association website or you can follow this link that's at tinyurl.com, 9LPOMME. They're um, Available, you can get either a general one or you can get a vanity plate where you pick whatever the le the numbers, digits, or letters that you want in, in the series go. It's a fundraiser for the Master Gardener Endowment, so half the money that you pay for your license plate goes actually to the endowment. And got a couple. The Master Gardener Conference is coming up. There's also an International Master Gardener Conference. We've got a lot of Master Gardeners from North Carolina going to Alaska to the International Master Gardener Conference. It's September 7th through the 14th. There's still time to register if you're, if you're interested in joining us. Okay, and the Master Gardener Conference is coming up. There's a link. If you just do North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Conference 2013, you'll get the website that has the program listed. They have a great lineup of, of exceptional speakers. It focuses on local foods. So there's lots of, of great uh, talks both on food production, you know, using vegetables through you know, canning, preserving in, in, in other ways, visits to gardens and farms. It's going to be a really fun time. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for joining us.